started. So tonight's very exciting topic, I hope. It's going to get a little spiritual. Because uh, today we're going to talk about influence. And I think for you know, the purposes of this, this lecture, I'm really going to try to gear it more towards people, we'll say around 15Q, maybe 15 to 20Q. Um, but I am, I am very liable to, to go off on more advanced tangents, so keep me, <laughs> keep me back. Uh, the other thing, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit scared to do this kind of topic because uh, the, tr the traditional way that I've either taught about influence or certainly students learn about influence has kind of been upheaved a little bit by the AIs and the robots and um, there's just some general concepts that don't really are, aren't the same assumptions, right? We're working from different assumptions. And a lot of it has to do with spacing of groups and stones on the board. Um, that, and that's a very hard concept to understand if you're 15Q, right? Like, like good spacing versus bad spacing. And so a lot of these robot positions, oh man, they, they're, we, ha we, have, we haven't quite figured out how to teach them to double digit Q players yet, right? Like, like they're, they're too nuanced. Um, there's often, they're playing a different game than, than what we would consider traditional uh, ghost strategy sometimes. So I'm going to try to bridge that gap today. So this is, this is my very, oh god, attempt to do so for the benefit of you guys. Uh, first, I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about my own experiences with influence. Um, because I think, I think a lot of Go players go through this. Where uh, you start playing Go, and you, you have this thing that happens on a lot of your games where uh, you know, you make a lot of shapes that look like this across the board. Not really playing moves in order, but do you guys have this happen to you in, in your games? You don't have this type of, well, I mean, there's other stones on the board, right? You can imagine. Come on. No? Yep. Okay, good, right? You, you, so maybe, you know, maybe you guys are all too good for this. You guys never went through this phase of wall building. Um, this, I, I remember going through this phase and right, thinking like, I'm gonna build this giant wall and I have all this influence, what am I gonna do with it? But then my opponent also had this giant influence, and I didn't know how to invade it, right? There was just this complete like, like next step problem, right? Like we build these walls and not really sure how we got there and not really sure where we're going. And I had a go teacher, uh, Jeff Chevelle, who's, you know, still, as far as I know, still occasionally playing Go, you know, maybe three or four down. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he would, he would see beginners like me at the time, again, this is, this is you know, over a decade ago, uh, make these kinds of shapes, and he said, no, look, you're doing this wrong. First, uh, in order to, to make these giant walls, uh, you first need to, you know, start with a point of influence. And then from those points of influence, you then build power. And from that power then comes territory. And so in these 15, 20 Q games, when you see these like giant shapes, like they're forgetting to build like these little points of influence and they're forgetting to build territory. They're just building like walls. They're just building power directly. And it's kind of ridiculous. Like if you, if you understand the flow of the game. Because every stone you play on this board, right? We say it has influence. How much influence does this stone have versus how much influence does this stone have? Do you guys feel like there's a difference in influence? That one has less influence than... Yeah, but why? Because <laughs> you can... Is this a definition of influence? Do I really have to define influence? Because I don't want to do that. That's hard. <laughs> That's really hard. Yeah, influence, influence is the capacity for, for a stone or a group, or all your stones or all your groups, to influence other stones or other groups. Right? It's about the network. It's about the, the relationships. And so when we're talking about influence, we're kind of talking about you know how many future potential relationships does anything have on this micro, macro, and micro level? That's not a word. Um, on this board, and that's why that's why I'm kind of like both excited to teach, like to try to introduce some of these concepts to you guys, as well as completely terrified because in the age of robots, oh man, some of these concepts don't apply. 
so this stone, we say it has some influence. We say this stone has more influence, but why? Closer to the center. It's closer to the center, so what does that have to do with anything? You can connect to other stones faster? Yeah, it's actually closer to a larger percentage of the board, right? Like, like just in terms of, you know, math, right? It's, it's average distance to more points is actually closer. So ergo, clearly, this is the most influential move you can play, right? No. Yes. No. I mean, sort of. I mean, kind of technically. But it's not. We, we don't usually play this move. And uh, that same teacher, Jeff, you know, he would say, look, if you, want, if you want territory, you play one of these moves. If you want, so, you know, if you want a, some influence, you play this move. If you want even more influence and less territory, you play one of these types of moves. But if all you want is influence, if you do not care about points, and you just want the influence, that pure, like, spiritual, future timeline connections to every other stone on the board, if that's all you want, you play this move. Hmm. Dan doesn't like it. That's okay. Well, no, I'm still there. This lecture's not for you, Dan. This is for 15 cues. Yeah, but I never learned about it as much. Okay. <laughs> I still make those shapes. You still make these models? <laughs> of course, it influences. We're going to come back to these shapes, okay? When we, when we go through like this influence of power thing. We're going to come back to that. But It influences connecting with the ability to connect with others. There's also the influence where you're just the caboose falling behind. And, and you're on the wrong side of influencing because you're on the weak sure, side. Sure, sure, yeah. So and your opponent this, has, has more influence. This may not be so good from that perspective. Okay, so well, well you're recognizing there's a yin yang, right? Because the problem with this, you, look, this stone has the easiest time affecting everything else on the board compared to any other move I can play. It's also not really claiming anything, right? It's not, it's not putting a stake to any particular area of this board. It's just kind of everywhere. Um, the robots, in general, do not like this, right? They're, they're all like, this is, you play here. <laughs> this is a good balance. Sometimes they play this one. Uh, any further out than this, in general, they're not, they're not a fan. But in the pro world, uh, we've actually been this way for quite a while. Like even coming out of the 90s and early 2000s, um, you know, in most profession, top professional games, you'd either see this move or this move. All right, these are your only two options. And it was even to the point where uh, there was a nine non Korean player who I can't remember his name, but I saw him I, uh, give a lecture and he said, Look, we're playing going to Korea. There's only two moves to start the game. You play here, you play here. That's, the, that's it. Nothing else is worth considering. Because these are the only two moves that balance that territory with the correct amount of influence. If you try to take more influence too quickly, you actually fall behind on points or fall behind on potential points. I'm going to play a stone here. Now, before. Uh, before robots, uh, there was starting to become a consensus about the best way to deal with this stuff if you're an opponent. Let's say you know some other corners got played. White wants to play a move. How would you bat how would you counter this, right? Like if you want to think of this like as a fight, like what is this move saying? Like what is the conversation that black is having? He's, he's taking some influence, but he's really interested in, you know, I'm, I'm, he's being a little more territorial. And so how do you overcome that? Someone who's getting a little bit influenced, but a little bit more on the territory? Get rid of those influence? Yeah, you actually take more influence. You're like, you know what, I want you to have those points. <clears throat> it's the most common move to counter this was this approach. What do you think of this white stone? Have you guys played this move in your games? Has someone, have you played against someone who's open 4-3? Yes. And what have you done when your opponent's open 4-3? How do you approach it? That. <laughs> you do this? OK, good. Last week, we said the robots played one. Yeah, the robots don't like this one. Yeah. And the reason the robots don't like this one. Mm. Well, I, have, I have robots played that one. Uh, there's, the robots don't like it because it's like a one point loss. So if the situation on the board is different, where it can gain more than a point because of the shape, it'll, ha it'll still play this. But in a vacuum, the robots don't play this. They need some other reason to play this way. And white has to play a stone somewhere over here. Maybe that. Who has influence here? 
white more so? White has more so. How much influence does black have? Some. 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 It's not completely gone, right? Black's not. This, these stones in particular can influence other stones, but not easily. White stones actually have a much easier time influencing the rest of the board in this case. What do you mean by influence? Yeah, that's what we're trying to find. It's real hard. <laughs> Uh, again, it's, it's having stones that can affect or connect to other parts of the board. But they're weaker. White stones are weaker. Oh. Yes, so the white, white's group actually isn't, isn't completely safe and has some problems. And so this is one of the reasons why the robots don't like this. Right? Even though you're getting a lot more influence, you know, there's some other ways for black to counter that again later on. Uh, so as we pointed out last week, the robots really don't like this move. They're like, this is too much influence. You're not taking enough solid territory. And they like this move. Ironically, I mean, ironically, but just fittingly, if black comes and attacks here, the robot's favorite group is to take a bunch of influence. All right, with this white group. Just build a wall and turn that outside into a, into a something like power. I'm going to call it power for now. We're gonna come back to this, these ideas. That this is this is gonna be this is not gonna be a a, a math class. <laughs> it's gonna be more of like a poetic prose kind of creative writing class, I think, today. A little more uh, florid descriptions. <laughs> so when White plays this one, again, we're saying. White wants to be on the outside. White, white wants to play stones that are going to keep black hemmed in, and white is going to take the outside for whatever that's worth. Uh, black started here. Do you know what type of move you would look for to keep black hemmed in and keep the influence for yourself? How do you keep the majority of the connections to the outside for white? How do you approach this? Yeah, very good. How strong are you? Perfect. All right, good. Nice. We have seen this. If your opponent has 3-3, three, three, you play 4-4. Four, four. Mm -hmm. And if your opponent has 4-4, four, four, you play 3-3. Three, three. Mm -hmm. It's like yin-yang kind of, <laughs> kind of duality. Uh, what does black play here in this stress Uh push. push. Push, yeah. Push. So we have this influence stone. We have this influential stone. We're now going to turn it into something like power. Push here. And black says, OK, you're just going to keep me low. This is an old Joseki, but we're going to play it anyway. How many points did Black make? Maybe 10. Yeah, probably a little bit. Probably a little bit more than 10 given endgame, but I'm sure we'll say 10. And how much influence does Black have? Not a lot. All of White Stones are basically there to keep Black from getting influence, right? White is saying, oh, you decided you want territory. Good for you, you could have the territory. That is all you get. I'm going to take the influence. <clears throat> mm, can black break through any either of these cuts? Like, is there a way for black to you know, turn this corner into an outside group at this point? Looks difficult. <laughs> really not possible. Not really. Yeah, it's really not possible. I mean, black can continue to, to take points along the side, right? But if white's already building a lot of influence, like, white's just going to be super happy just to keep taking influence, right? You can keep taking your little tiny points. Yeah. Anything over here, maybe even play this one first. It's like, aha, I'm out. Or I can say, you know what, I'm just going to take more influence. <laughs> In Go, there's this duality, this yin-yang feature of the third and fourth line. And <clears throat> I think stronger Go players kind of feel this very intuitively. But when you're 15Q, this is a really big deal. You're like, oh my god, should I play my next move on the third line or the fourth line? Are you guys at 15Q yet, or are you not quite having that conversation in your head? Not yet there yet? I'm going to introduce that, that little schizophrenia inside <laughs> you today. <clears throat> because in Go, uh, look at this position. Who got a bunch of stones on the third line? Black. Who got a bunch of stones on the fourth line? White. This is a pretty pure situation where one player got almost exclusively influence, and one person got almost exclusively territory. And that is that, is that third and fourth line duality. If we, expect, if we play a lot of stones on the third line, 
we're going to be the ones who are expecting to get territory, and we're leaving the influence out there for our opponents to take, and vice versa. If we play all of our stones on the fourth line, we're actually not claiming much to ter you know, in terms of territory. You see, uh, this happened to beginners all the time. Where, let's, let's play a game. Let's say both of them are fighting over influence, kind of, like all four fours. That's not a real fight, I mean, it's a very meta, meta kind of fight. Black comes down here, and white's like, aha, well, I'm gonna play a high, because I don't want him to you know, take influence. I want to keep influence. It's like, aha, I'm gonna play high, because I still want influence. And white goes, yeah, I'm gonna take more influence. Take more influence. No one's playing any stones on the third line, which means there is no territory going on in this game. Right? Every position here is invadable. Say so black, black play last move, five, four. It's like, aha, I'm gonna take more influence. And at some point, if you're a beginner, you don't realize you're taking influence, you start thinking you're taking territory. You're like, look at how solid my positions are, these are amazing. All right, maybe black plays here, and white plays here. You guys ever play a game like this? No? You never played a game like this? You call yourselves 15 cues? <laughs> Thank you, Sam, yes, I got one. Well, here's the thing. At any point, black can just go, uh-huh, mine. <laughs> come in the corner and take it. Or come in here and live here. Or come here and just split this right down the middle. Or come over here. This is, this is code for life, just straight up, if you, if you play just very conventionally. Uh, I'm sorry, that, that's code. This is... This is a little more complicated, actually. But I can probably put there. There you go. <laughs> Easier. I don't have to deal with it. Uh, or here, right? These are all good invasion points. Sometimes if you're fancy, you can play with poke from that side. But both of these players are just waiting for the other person to actually invade their influence. Like, neither player has taken any sort of concrete territory. So if that's the case, uh, you know, it might be true that the players don't know that they're only taking influence, they're not taking any territory. But let's assume they're good enough to know that, oh, these, none of these moves take territory. So why would they leave so much territory? What are they hoping to achieve by gaining so much influence? Turn that into territory somehow? So you're just gonna, so you're, so you're gonna, one, two, three, one, two, black's move, one, two, three, one, two, three, black's move, so black's gonna start turning into territory like that. That's gonna be like, no, my territory. <laughs> black's gonna be like, more territory. That's my territory. 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 <laughs> territory. This is how this is gonna go. <laughs> territory. <laughs> Notice in order to start turning things into territory, they had to play a bunch of moves on the third line. <laughs> right? Number one, that's how I started turning this into territory. But this is really inefficient. Like, it's actually really slow just to take a bunch of influence and turn it into territory. Like, it's really not good go. Why does it look like Flax winning? With the move. This is too low. Black can, black can still invade. Yeah, but can he really still invade? After Black plays a move? Yeah, maybe. I think you have invasion there, invasion there. Maybe. I think that's actually a good point, too. I mean, Black should play a central center move now, I would say. Okay, sure, fine. This is this is. <laughs> but that's the influential move, isn't it? I mean, it Maybe. influences. That seems good. White's expansion. Uh, mm -hmm. Seems yeah. good. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, that's, not, that's not. That's not really my point. The point is, uh, both these players decide they were playing much influence, and then something weird happened. Like, does this feel strange? Like this sequence mm -hmm. of moves. So. Both players take influence for what purpose? To make it to turn into territory? If you just wanted to, to do territory, when, to do better when they a fight begins, they've got to back up. Ah, there we go. Uh, influence is a lot like uh, you know getting your R and D team to do some <laughs> nuclear weapons research. <laughs> like you know you get your your Boeing airplane manufacturers to make out a few F 16s You know you get your you know, you get your training and your, your basic, care. like, 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 they're doing the readiness for war, right? They're not, they're not, when you're building influence, 
you are, you are getting ready for something epic. You're not actually just, t you're not happy with what you have. You are looking for something bigger. You are an imperialist. You're about to go invade a country and just take their stuff and bring it back to the motherland. Rape and pillage. <laughs> okay? That's, that's what these players are really starting to aim for, right? When they're just fighting over this influence, this kind of ridiculous sequence, they weren't, set, they weren't building out all these tanks and all these airplanes and all these you know, battalions so they could then say, nope, we're just going to sit home and plant a garden now and turn that influence into that territory. That's not the point of influence. And so that's why I mean when it's really inefficient. So if somebody starts to, starts to take territory, and the opposing starts to hem them in, let them have that territory hem them in, yeah. they start to just build up their own territory. That's right. Yeah. Um, it happens naturally, right? By, by this. It seems more efficient um, because you're not wasting time. I mean, all you're doing is trading moves with the other person. Yeah. And, and that way, whereas if you tried to build territory, they've got the move to do something. But if all you're doing is responding to their local territory, you're building without having lost a turn. Right, you're, you're, you're giving them just a couple points along the edge for hopefully something far greater. And it's turning that far greater thing into something later on. That's what makes Go exciting. Uh, well, let's see if you lost my next point. I had a point next. I had this planned. <laughs> uh, this influence thing, uh, military, okay. I totally lost it. It's okay if we start talking about how to do that part. Where you how to do that part where you turn the influence? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so I had a great next point, though. I really am upset about myself. All right, here, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to this type of thing. I'm going to remember exactly in the middle of this next thing. I have to come back and be distracted and never teach you anything. This is just how it's going to be. Uh, <clears throat> there's two black stones here. There's this concept I've alluded to called power. Where are these two black stones projecting power? To the left. This way. Is that what you guys all, would all agree? Or is this news? This might be, if this is news to you, this is fantastic. We're having a moment. <laughs> so these two stones project power this way. These two white stones project power which way? The other way. It's black's move. Watch what black do. Gets into spacing, right? This is kind of a spacing question, but conceptually, what should black do, right? If you have if you have two two armies, right, that are lined up kind of far away, push up on the other one, get closer. So you gonna do a sneak attack? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't understand. Using your influence somehow, so maybe ten D or. Yeah, you claim the land first, <laughs> right? When you have two, two opposing militaries and they're like, we both want this thing, speed matters, right? Like ownership is nine tenths of the law kind of thing. You take it first. Uh, here's the thing, both players still have a lot of power here. White's power has been greatly reduced, but still has backup for this invasion. Uh, what if black didn't do this? What if black just said something like this? White might ask for a little bit more. How does this feel? Better for white? It is better for white, but why? Well, I mean, I guess it's not exactly territory yet, but it looks like it projects more toward the middle. I mean, it projects toward a larger area. All right, what if I take these two stones away? Who is this better for? Why? White stones are weaker than black. This is better for black. Isn't that weird? I'll put these back. That's better for white. This is why we're going on a spiritual journey tonight, guys. 
There's an overinvestment in protection by black. Yeah, right? This is, it goes about efficiency at the end of the day. Uh, <clears throat> I told you this, this projects power, right? It projects power in this direction. When we have power, that means, that means we, we have uh, loyal subjects somewhere out here that we just have to call to our side to rally. Like, they'll respect us. <laughs> But instead of, instead of expressing domain over the entire countryside, we're just, we're just going to the first little buttercup flower in the meadow, meadow and saying, that's mine. Right, this, is, this is not very projecting very much power. Likewise, this projects power this way. How, how, how expansive are we asking our power to be here when we put us down here? Very pessimistic, right? In this case, we want this to project this way. This would also be nice for black. This is very much in balance, where we have you know, an army backing up some swath of land we're claiming for ourselves. Right? We have influence over this domain. We have influence here too, it's just not big enough. We're being very defensive, right? We're being very, we're hermit, hermiting. And so when I take away these two stones, the situation kind of changes. The, this is actually too thin. Black can still invade in here. It's, it's okay, like it's not a bad position. This is a better corner position to fight from. This is a much stronger connection. White can't invade in here directly. White has to do a lot of work to break into this. So we just add two more stones. The power that we get from this influence, you need to respect it. You need to start appreciating that this stone on the board changes how this entire top will feel to both players in terms of what's attackable and what's not. Uh, if you don't quite understand what I mean, let's look at some, in, in, let's, I'm gonna put this shape back on the board and look at some in, sort of invasion sequences to try to explain why this stone matters over here, why this stone has influence on this side of the board. If, you didn't, if you're white and you do not want all these things to become your, your opponent's points, what do you have to do? Invade. You have to invade, you have to, you have to break it up somehow. Where do you want to do that? 12C. Well, see, all right, that's a good point. We're gonna do this instead, because it's more fun. <laughs> all right, but like I said, this stone has power. What's black gonna play here? Kick, I heard kick, was that Bill? Ah, see, Bill's a little stronger than the rest of the 15th. He's been around a few times. Are you the one who usually does the kicking, or the one getting kicked, Bill? Um, I'm usually the one getting kicked. Aw. <laughs> if you're always getting kicked, try this move. This position, but okay. So black's going to kick white. What do you think white should do? This would be the normal expected move. If white doesn't get this, and black is telling a move, that feels real bad for your stone. All right, white's gonna come up this way. Uh, let's say black's move. Oh, look, black already has a stone here. That's really useful. I'm just gonna come on top of this. Where does white go now? Twelve C thirteen. Twelve C make base. Okay. Black might go, huh? That's a that's a nice group you got there. Let's kick it again. Respond. Jump, how does this white group feel? Pretty good. <laughs> white has two options. Well, I can try jumping out. But better move? Maybe another better move in this shape. Has anyone been in this shape? You guys seen this before? That's one. Alive. No, but it's alive. I know, I know it's alive. <laughs> but he sealed it. Black seals him in. He can seal him in. Yeah, well, well black could Probably perfect could. it. You don't need to do this yet. Uh, um, black has a lot of forcing loops here. For instance, black can threaten to kill this way. I'm going to do this way. We can force out some sort of sequence where white just has to live. How many points does white get? Two, two. <laughs> what does black get? A lot of influence. Oh man, this is nice. This is 
<laughs> it's still not points yet, though. It's still <laughs> invadable. Mm. But for the low price of giving white two points. It's not so invadable. Yeah, I think white can. If it does the obvious. Yeah. But if when it goes down. What's the response? Okay, black goes down? No, no, not that. Connect. Black, connect, white. yes? Are we connecting? Are you playing connect? Right, right. So, okay, if you can look like that, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. Well, you can still do things over here, okay? Just, you still have to play it. Yeah, yeah, um, There's still things to do. Uh, but black has a lot of benefit here, right? White's not going to make any territory here, here, or here for the rest of the game, right? Imagine, imagine uh, the empty go board, right? Where you'd say, look, every space on the board could be my territory or it could be your territory. Every space is 50% mine or 50% my opponent's. Is that case for all of this? <laughs> no. No, it's going to be like 50% mine or 50% no one's. <laughs> and so, so even if you expect to only get half of the points in this area here, right. that is way more than two points. So black, black stands to get one point in the corner. Oh yeah, black can turn the corner to just you yeah, know yeah. solid twenty points yeah, with one white. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go oh, hold on too far. Uh, let's go back to this point. Oh, not that yet. Um, we kicked. White extended. I was like, oh, look at this. Black was able just to almost seal this group in and kill it, almost, right? What if black doesn't have this stone? Like, trying to cut that. Oh, yeah. White, white can totally find a cut here now, right? Real easy. And maybe even better than a cut. Uh, or maybe you guys all know this cut, right? Mm -hmm. Poke at the elephant eye. This kind of works. This could be even more violent, though. This could be very fun for white. What does white try to do here? Or what is sorry? What does black try to do after this move? Uh, this one. Come on top. Okay, white move. Cut. Cut. Okay, black move. Fix this way. White move. Um, honey. This honey? I probably I wouldn't play this honey. But 15F. 15F, you want an Atari? Yeah. Okay, no, all you are wrong. <laughs> In a fight like this, who has the weakest group right now? White. Instead of instead of using it to try to attack something with these very violent moves, Hane is an Atari. Just make it stronger. Yeah. You just have to extend. And this extension is good. This extension is good. Both these are very nice. Because what about these two stones now? Yeah, now black has the weakest group on this table. And you know what? This corner? This corner is actually still kind of a nuisance for for black later on. Later on, white will play a move like this. Even if we play very simply. Like so. This is called an L group. L groups are dead. So this is why I like this extension. Right? You're actually still threatening all the same things you were threatening, right? You're still attacking this, you're still attacking the corner, but man, do you get stronger faster than your opponent has time to let you get stronger. How do you kill the group? What a great question. 17. Well, well first of all, first of all, it's it's dead. Like it's just dead. It can't live. The group can't live. Let's try to make it live first. Yeah, Black's turn. I'm telling you it's dead. Yeah. 17 A. 17 A. This looks like a great move, right? Do you guys know your dead shapes? Yeah, sure. So, P18. Mm. Dead. Dead. So, I think the cool. best try is 18 A. 18 A, this looks better. Looks more promising. How to kill.
B18. B18? B19. B19, thank you. Close. One off. This one. Oh. <laughs> Tilts. This one, killer. Black says, no, that's mine. Black says, aha, I'm going to make a Seki. I know my life and death shapes. I'm just going to make a Seki. This is not Seki. <laughs> Why is this not Seki? Because these get filled in the outside of the breeze. Yeah, when these get filled in, Black's an Atari. <laughs> Black off to play there and then die. <clears throat> So, going back to the original position. The difference between black having a stone here and not having a stone here is pretty huge. Especially when it comes to the safety and viability of any group for white over here. Like, we're talking about a significant amount of influence from a stone on this side of the board. And granted, the further away you get, the less of an influence uh, this stone has on this side of the board, but it's still always there. And pro players and robots, they spend a lot of time and effort actually figuring it out, like how much influence is really there. Uh, there is, uh, I mean, there's a lot of sequences that professionals have figured out, um, especially in these common fuseki, um, where they've tried to do like little spacing tricks on each other, just, just you know, moving a st cheating a stone one line further or one line closer to change the amount of influence over here. Uh, a very super basic example of that is called Kobayashi Fuseki. Has anyone heard that word before? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a dumb Fuseki, but here's the idea. Play there. Uh, play, oh, sorry, white move. White gets a move. Uh, white gets a move. Do it right. Why does it feel wrong? I haven't played Kobayashi in like years. I ever forgot Kobayashi because the robots took over. No one plays Kobayashi. This isn't right. <laughs> Why is this wrong? This is wrong. Because <laughs> I can't play Kobayashi anymore. Oh, here. This is also, this is a Fuseki. <laughs> Where Black's immediately going to attack this stone and make this stone uncomfortable. And do you know why Black feels so confident in doing that? Because of this stone, mm -hmm. right? It's the same kind of thing where we just we just looked at this kind of situation. Is this stone having an effect over here? Mm -hmm. In a lot of these fusekis, uh, especially from like the late '90s, early 2000s, um, the, pro the professional players are figuring out how to use this stone to attack this site. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, why can't I remember this? <laughs> That's embarrassing. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Close. Uh, all right, so if I just told you that a stone like this actually has a pretty profound effect over here, imagine what this stone has. Yeah, it actually has, actually almost in some ways has less of an effect over here though, right? Like it's further away and you're actually not, you're not building anything, you're not giving yourself potential to make anything large. And so again, going back to that early point where I said, this stone, you know, is all the influence, but it's also not it's it's weird. Like it's you've gone too far. Um, you know, if it's, it's this is kind of like the equivalent of like I told you that kale was good for you to eat, and you just ate nothing but kale, <laughs> right? Like there's a little bit of a balance to this. Uh, let's look at uh, related position. Okay, Dan. Anyone seen this before? Chinese. Hey, Chinese, very nice. Chinese Fuseki. Mm, nobody talks about it anymore, do they? Uh, the robots actually don't seem to mind it. Like, I don't, I don't think they, they think the win percentage is that bad for it, but it's definitely not the thing that it was. So a little, a little brief history lesson. Um, in the early 1980s, uh, China had started getting Go players 
that were, we'll say, able to compete with Japan, right? That for for you know all the second half of the 20th century, we had Japanese pro basically dominating the scene. Uh, and there was one Chinese player in particular uh, who was able to break through and, and you know make China Chinese go like you know on the world stage. Does anyone know that this Chinese go player? Ni Wei Ping. Ni Wei Ping. Very good. Uh, but all of Ni Wei Ping's students um, would be able to go and fight with the, the Japanese players evenly, but they all could not beat the Japanese in the opening. Like so, all these Chinese versus Japanese tournament games would go. The Japanese players would pull ahead in the opening, the Chinese players would catch up in the middle game during the fighting and the invading and, and the really hard reading sequences, and then the Japanese players would come back again in the end game. And so this was kind of the format. But the Chinese had this secret weapon where they all, not all, but many of them started playing this very set fuseki that became known as the Chinese fuseki. And uh, when you play this, it's not, it's not that the game is uncomplicated because it's still, it's still a, a comp it can be a complicated opening. But because they just start like collapsed all the infinite possibilities down to like one sort of opening, they could study it, learn it, master it, and, and fight out of it very quickly. And so this became known as the Chinese opening. And then there are several variations of it, which this is called the low Chinese. This is the high Chinese. Uh, later on, there's going to be the mini Chinese and the micro Chinese, where you make this corner white. Uh, mini Chinese, I'm oh, sorry, uh, mini Chinese, <laughs> micro Chinese, uh, <laughs> I don't know. They have, there's, there's, you know, sort of hum additionally humorous names for these different variations, <laughs> right? Like, you know, this is your, I don't know, fortune cookie Chinese. <laughs> it doesn't exist, it's not a thing. <laughs> it's like fortune cookie Chinese, okay. Uh, all right, let's go back to regular Chinese. And here's my question to you. Is it looks like black is trying to build territory, right? Not directly. What is black really trying to do? Like, what is the point of making this type of formation? Get the opponent to invade you. Get the opponent to invade you. In other words, build a bunch of influence that is so large your opponent has to invade. And then what are you going to do with that? Invasion. Fight really well. Yeah, you're going to attack it. And that's this is what the Chinese had going, right? They were good, you know, compared to the Japanese players, really good at really long, complicated reads and fights. And so we just need a way to start the game and get into these long and complicated fights real quickly. Part of the reason for that is that uh, Japanese Go, much earlier on than, than Chinese and Korean Go, started with the open board. Historically, Chinese and Korean games started with something called placement. Like, this was not how a game, uh, the empty go board was not how a game of Go started, right, in those other countries. They actually start with the four corners already having stones in them. And so the Chinese, in particular, didn't really study the opening. They didn't develop their own system of opening because the board was already open. Like, it already had stones on it. They would play out of that. So where, where is white going to come in here? Where is white going to invade this influence? Yeah. Remind me your name. Alan. Alan? Yep. Uh, maybe F3? F3. Hey, this is good. <clears throat> Not bad. Where's black gonna play? Uh, D3, maybe? Uh, probably not so defensive. Maybe play the bigger side. Oh, uh, yeah. That's okay. All right, good. Uh, what's white gonna do? C3. Ah, good. Slightly more modern. If you were playing a little more traditional, maybe here. Yeah. But already you're forced to invade, right? Like if you're if you're looking if you're looking at this, you're like, mm, that's 27 points if black gets all of that. <laughs> I have this and this. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, we got to invade. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is black going to do? Uh, D3. Okay. White. D2. Nice. Black. Black has a good choice here. Uh, E2. Yeah, so if black wants influence this way and to fight over here, we play this way. White has to live. Okay. What did we just turn this 4-4 four, four stone into? 
influence. A wall, it, yeah, power, right? We've gone from one influence stone to power. Last thing I want you know. We've got, we've got the army, right? We built, we built the cruise missiles. We got Space Force. <laughs> now it's time to conquer. Okay, that's one way it could go. Here's another way it could go. Uh, here. Instead of black coming down, black's gonna play this way. White. Atari. What did black get here? Not 27 points, so it's less than 27 points. What did white get? Nothing. Uh, points, some points. Yeah, a few. A few. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So less than 18. So let's, let's round down to 15, minus another three of five. So in, in the end, this is really closer to only 10 points, right? Where black was looking at you know, up to 27. That's okay, reasonable. Mm. But what does black have now? Next move. Next move. There. All right. So what? You've got this corner. You've got this corner. You've got that. How do you feel on territory? As long as all this doesn't turn into black territory, you're great. So what do you have to do? All right, where do you invade? Another corner. Okay, where? Give me a point. Uh, 15D, maybe, or 15D. One of these two, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Pick one. We'll put it right there on the three and a half line. <laughs> <laughs> Go see. Okay, this gives black what black wanted. Black has a bunch of influence and has something to attack. And in this case, either one of these cases, really, um, this whole formation, this Chinese formation, we put a stone here, a stone here. We didn't put these influence stones out to make territory here. We actually played these stones to make territory here. Even if this wasn't there, we still, we're still going to actually make territory over here. Do you want to try it? Sure. Shit. Sure. This is weird. It's a magic trick. I told you. We're getting, <laughs> we're getting spiritual. It's a little bit. Jesus walks on water. This is the point, part of the... Black's going to attack. What do you do is white? Okay. Stand up. <coughs> this case, here or here, either one. Play a little bit more, play a little more conservative. How does this white group feel? F15. F15. You want to jump? Maybe. No. Oh, that's so scary to me. I think black will fight. I mean, like, like, again, black was, you know, the young Chinese upstart players are really good at fighting. Like, these. You know, Japanese pros were very calm, very, you know, getting slight advantages during the opening. We're just lost here, right? Just like, how many moves did we play before white is just under attack? Maybe, but this is a little bit more conservative. This would be an easier way to get out. But now what's Black's next idea? E14. Uh, E15, are you gonna cut? E14. You don't really want to, you can't cut here because this cut doesn't work. Oh, yeah. I think it's... Right, this ladder. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the cut, this, that's why you play this one rather than this one. This one, this one is fighting, like we're going we're gonna to throw down. This one is, I just want to get out. Uh -huh. So, black. G60. Uh -huh. Beautiful, nice. Okay, is white alive? Yeah. Are we going to run out again? Okay. <laughs> but it's, it seems like before that third move, it's still it's hard to like stop white from escaping, right? You need to oh, you want white to escape? It's we're we're playing with our prey. Well, yeah, so. so the problem is you're a human and you don't hunt for your food. Well, what I'm saying is, it, it seems like white doesn't even necessarily need to play another move to get away here. Okay. You're gonna be brave. Sure. I probably need to connect there, like 14. You wanna play that one? 
<laughs> okay. You're doing great. Nice move, because it didn't work. You want that one? Right here? This one? Uh, I was in the first one. It looks real good for black, doesn't it? Huh? I'll, I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> this, is not, this doesn't feel good for white. I, I mean, maybe we try that, or maybe maybe this move is actually uh, shape Suji. But uh, we could try this. This is real risky. We're actually, I, don't, I think this is just a word play, right? You can't touch this way now. We could just play the most crude cut sequence. Mm. <sighs> if White still wants to push out, these two cells are going to get Run either attack or die. Yeah. Run Let's assume. Mm, Let's assume you're fine. <laughs> oh, White has to play these moves. <laughs> Maybe you to play there in tempo. I'm gonna find another one. Okay. So do you remember how, how, how punished White sort of felt for invading here and not getting completely safe? Mm -hmm. That was when Black only had three stones here. No, two stones here? Well, yeah, two stones here, sorry. Black didn't even have anything over here yet. How's, how's invading over here gonna go? Very bad. Well, depends on the opponent. Depends on the opponent. Okay, that's, that's always a rule. Uh, but we just had an arms build up, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you're a country that never needs to go fight in a war, you're probably not gonna have a big military. But you've just triggered the immune system here. Right, all the antibodies are now after this group. And oh man, are they ready to attack anything else that comes nearby, right? We've just, we've just given someone a vaccine. There's the, vac there's, there's the weak, ineffective virus <laughs> we just built ourselves on so with all this influence. Is <laughs> this, is al and this is a great analogy, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, may have, I may have gone from war to disease, but it's all death, it's all death. <laughs> So you had, White had to invade, but he wanted to do it without um, provoking, for, forcing your opponent to actually build a good offense defense. Mm -hmm. So, so how do you do it? Uh, so I can I can show you some of the patterns that pro players kind of figured out, and then the robots have also kind of pooed on, but. Um, there, if, if, if you're really interested, in, particularly in this opening, there's a really good book written by Cho Chikun. Uh, I think it's called The Chinese Opening. Um, that he goes over you know, his conclusions to what the best patterns are to get out of this without provoking such a strong immune response and letting your opponent build up all this influence very naturally. Um, I can show you briefly kind of like what, what some of those patterns look like. Uh, it's there. Uh, this move is good. And what, at the time, the most common response to this move is here. Again, Black isn't trying to build territory here. Black is trying to attack this to build territory here. It's not there, it's not there. Uh, so black plays this move. Attach. Threaten the base. Dan's very excited. If we play here. Ugh, feels bad, right? We've put a lot of stones and just trying to make a base. No, you don't like it. This is this is pro games. Like this is serious. Like top level play was this pattern. Uh, I can't know if this comes first or this comes first. There might be a move. I think this comes first. I'm gonna play this, this way. Black 
Uh, uh, something over here. Oh, all the way. Yeah, so you can, you can uh, all the way over there. Pick, pick a move. Cool. What did White get here? Mm, points? A couple points. And more importantly, uh, we did not give Black all this territory. Right? That, that was really White. White saw, you know, this side of the board, three black stones on it, black is threatening something very uh, large in terms of points. So we invaded it, we invaded it successfully. White still has a little bit of this, you know, turtle head poking out here. So there might be future play over here. Um, there is a little bit of a defect here. Maybe we can use that to invade this later. Uh, but in short, white doesn't feel like they got very much. What did black get? Uh, black started with a whole bunch over there. So. Black had two stones. It wasn't a whole bunch. It was two stones. Oh yeah, but I had that stuff on the left too. Okay, fine. This is still that's unchanged. Sure. All right. So, but what else did Black get? I'm not not really. I mean, this this you can count, right? We solidified this with these stones. So we solidified territory we were already looking like we were going to have. That's not a huge loss. That's one of the reasons why White finds this acceptable, right? Like I'm like you guys are looking at this like White is garbage. And I'm like, well, no, actually, like. These points are already kind of blacks. There's actually a defect on this side of the board. Black didn't get that uber strength to feel really confident about turning this into territory. So this, is, this was playable by pros. The influence over here isn't, isn't perfect. There's a way to attack it later. So, but black still got influence over here, right? right. There's still potential for a lot of points on this side very quickly. Right. Uh, and we did solidify here. So, <clears throat> You know, these influent, influent stones, right? We're not using them to build territory, like in the slightest, right? Black put a stone here, a stone here. There is no black territory between those two stones. Black is only using them to attack. And the Chinese opening is a really great example of that because that was the whole point of it, right? It was like, let's get influence and let's use it to attack. End of story. That's how we're going to play Go because we don't know any better because the Japanese players are all better than us at the opening. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. And it worked. Uh, for many years, right, to the point where we're in, uh, even up to like the 2000s, right, many top pros in Japan, Korea, China were still playing this Chinese opening, right, it was still being explored, new variations were being uh, discovered and, ex and, you know, experimented with. Uh, but it all has to do with the idea that we have this influence and we're not going to use it for territory. If you can take that mindset, right, and adopt it to every stone you put on the board, right? Where you, if you have these loosely connected stones, don't th think of them more like a trap. Like, you guys like the game Mousetrap? I don't think of it like that. Think of it like, uh, I don't know. You guys hunters? <laughs> no, okay. Here go players. <laughs> you guys don't even know which end of gun to hold. All right. But you understand the concept of a trap, right? Like, like these, these influence stones are really, you know, little, little, I can't even call it the metaphor, right? They're, they're there to threaten some sort of danger, right? Like for your opponent. Like, like if you do not do anything, something large will happen over here. And when your opponent triggers that trap, you have to use those stones to, to their full power, right? That means attack. If you build a wall, and let's just exchange some stones. If nothing else is on this board, where is this wall facing? Where is the power? Oh, oh. oh here, right? If you're, if you're 20Q, you think it's still going this way. And you might laugh at this, but, I'm, but I'm, I've seen 20Q games, right? Where they're like, oh, the stones are all running this way, therefore the next big move is this way. Right? Like, run, run, run. You have momentum. That's physics. It's a vector. <laughs> Next biggest move. No, it's geometry. <laughs> right? This is the power. This is the direction of the power. So black has to play a balancing move over here at some point if black wants to use this power. Black has to make that trap in order to use this influence that has now been turned into power. Would white want to play there too? Absolutely. White would love to play over here. And so, you know, in this scenario, I don't know, if it's white's move, that looks pretty good. Maybe even there, maybe you show it a little bit of respect, back off. You, you know, you say, okay, you can, you can have your power. Stay over here. Don't want to get burned by your fire. Just let you burn yourself out. If white plays here, how is black going to respond to this? How is black going to use this influence? Yeah, black is going 
berserk barbarian mode, right? Like, I have fire! <laughs> you shall burn! Right? That's why white might be a little bit like, uh, we're gonna, you know, give us some space. And that way, if, you know, black still comes at you like a crazy person, he's like, I have fire, you shall burn. You're like, you know, that's nice. I got, I got some room over here. It's, it's, I'm not too close to the fire. It's actually kind of cozy. It's a nice living room, you know. A little bear rug on the floor. Hot cup of tea in hand. It's fine. If this is closer, I don't know. Black's gonna, black's gonna do as we're, uh, you know, actually maybe that one, maybe that one first. This type of shape. Have you guys seen this before? This is a, another, this is a, like a middle game Joseki. You actually don't know how it works because of this stone. This, this is actually a new situation. Um, actually, yeah, why am I just being trouble? I'm gonna this, this uh, call. If we can play this way. Maybe just that. Uh, normal, normally there isn't this, this, there isn't all these stones here, so this is, this is a little bit... Here, I'm gonna do it the normal way. <laughs> Turn it back. White, black, white. Normally when white cuts here, black just pulls back. Unless white make nine. But because black is so strong, you, ha you have this power, you have to, you have to, you know, have that barbarian spirit. Turn that, inf that influence, right, into power and find a way to attack. You have to you attack. So this is letting white off a little bit too easily. And because black has a stone here and a stone here, we can look at playing this move. Sometimes you even get this move. This move is bad here, though. <laughs> Why is this move bad in this case? Well, it's not The ladder's broken, because we have stones here. But is white going to save this stone? No! Who nodded? Stop it. <laughs> well, it's gonna go this way. Oh, again. If white just connects. Connects. You're gonna block. This is bad. This is bad. Black's like, I cut you. <laughs> Actually, this, yeah, this is, this is not good. There are cuts. Let me take that Atari first. Uh, depending on what you want, this might be best. All right, so this is a major trouble. But if black saves this, these are dead. Well, actually, uh, let's, let's get you out. Oh, here, so you see this, right? You guys can see this one. Ladder. Black plays this one first. Is it still a ladder? How do you ladder it? Do you ladder first? No. P. 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 Oh, this one? Yeah. No. Oh, and nice. this. Right here. Slider. Yeah. Add infinite. <laughs> so, uh, do we learn anything? No. <laughs> sequence. Uh, all right, so you have power, so you have, you have some influence stones, you turn into power. You know, uh, my old teacher, Jeff, when I was living in Texas, would say, then you can make territory. I'm telling you, no, that's wrong. You go influence to power to barbarian. <laughs> and I think that is the overarching lesson of this, you know, influence lecture for 15Q. Build influence, that's great. You know, find ways to make influence the board. Fourth line stones have more influence than third line stones. If you have an opportunity where your opponent wants territory, great, lean on him, make power. That's when your opportunity to turn those little influence stones into something stronger. Big walls, big 
shapes. And then once you have a big shape, what do you do? You bait your opponent into invading it. You, bait, you hopefully play a balancing move to bait your opponent into invading it. But even if you don't, and someone gets too close to your power, burn it. you burn it all down. <laughs> You just go. That's the only. If you don't, if you do not do this, right? If you end up with a bunch of power stones, and you do not, if you are not ever willing to just burn something to the ground and go after it, you're going to lose the game because your opponent has more territory than you. You know, it's it, think of it. Uh, it's not quite like uh, like pulling the goalie in hockey. Hey, <laughs> right? You guys know hockey how it works. Your team's behind. What do you have to do? Started by. <laughs> <laughs> Started by. <laughs> also correct. <laughs> yeah, you 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 bait, you bait the other team's best players into a fight. You put them in the penalty box, right? And I don't know. Uh, or right, you know, the last two minutes or whatever, right? They they pull the goalie. They're like, let's put more offensive players out on the ice. I think statistically, it's actually a worse strategy, right? I think someone, some like mathematician, did like all the games where, like pulling pulling your goalie and putting extra offensive members actually results in net fewer goals or something. I remember reading about it. I don't know. If anyone actually knows anything about hockey and is watching this video, please chime in at this point. Correct. So, but anyway, yes, influence to power to the bitch must die. Okay, <laughs> that's that's what you've hopefully absorbed today. So, you want to, you want to try it out in some games? Yeah. yeah. Sure. All right. Let's 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 put theory into practice. You all have a new religion. <laughs>